Welcome everyone to Ops 115. Uh, I'm here with the Mir Mandelovich, Principal PM working on Azure Monitor Logs, formerly known as Log Analytics. So stay tuned. Hey Mir, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much, Pierre. So uh we're talking about uh, Azure Log Monitor Logs, or formerly known, as I mentioned, uh, as Log Analytics. Uh, this is a service that basically is underpinning a lot of other services uh, in Azure, which makes it very, very important to get the design right. Correct? Correct. We are the foundation of services like Azure Sentinel, like Azure Security Center, uh, automation and 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 few others. So uh, we we have this concept of let let's keep all the logs in one place and architect it correctly. And you get lots of advantages out of that. And I would touch some of them in the, in the session today. Oh, that's perfect. So exactly, what are we uh, going to be uh, covering today? So I would talk about. Yeah, sorry for that. So today we would look mainly on two topics around like high scale deployments and enterprise deployments. And okay. the, one of the reason for that is that like throughout the, the, the last year and a half, what we see is, is, is huge uptake of the service. We see lots of customers. When I'm saying customers, I'm saying like customer from all sizes, starting in mamas and papas shops, and going all the way up to, to Fortune 50 companies. So okay. uh, every vertical in the world, every geography you can think about. So you can think about like you have like, we have banking, even like the most sensitive type of banking and investment. Mm -hmm. And we have manufacturing, we have retail, every vertical you can think about. We have lots of big and, and the leading companies that are using us. And, and it's one thing to deploy one system in one place, as I explained, like log is like the, the most trivial problem you can find. You just have a file and you omit logs. It's, it's not a problem in small scale. The problems and the, the challenges that you have start to raise when you go to very, very high scale. And this is our focus, how we deliver a service that, that can work in, 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 in terabytes or tens of terabytes per day uh, that can get you analytics and results in this scale uh, and can get you everything working and visibility into your services uh, and and not doing it just for like one machine, two machines, three machines, but to do it in, in org wide experience. So this is our challenges and this is what I would share today. Okay, so when we're looking at designing for higher scale, it, it, are we, really looking at like for you mentioned mom and pop shop all the way up to uh um uh, the big like top 50 companies does that mean that the way you architect for a mom and pop shop and the way you architect for a, a very large corporations are like uh completely opposed to uh not opposed but the, at the different end of that spectrum or is it a common design uh approach that you take so we are a SaaS service we we don't look at ourselves as like we give you servers and do whatever you want with them we are trying to provide the service as part of this paradigm we we take care about all the aspects of managing so of course if you have like a very small company that just like sends like few megabytes of logs and they are not even paying because they are on the free tier uh, they start with their workspace and they might grow and grow. And we love to see customers growing because they are they have business success there. And, uh, and they can grow. And behind the scenes, we are making lots of stuff to move them, to support them in, in whatever scale they, they can do. So we have workspaces that started with megabytes uh, per, per month and moving all the way to tens of terabytes per month without doing anything. Okay. So the system is completely supporting that. Okay. Still, 
large organizations and complex organizations have additional needs. And this is what we would touch here. Like they have additional considerations that we have to talk about. But the platform itself is completely transparent. You can go from zero to, 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 to huge enterprise without doing anything. Just pump and pump and add more data. There is no need to deploy anything. There is no need to configure anything. It just works. But when we talk to this like very large and complex organization, they have their unique uh, requirement. And this is what we would touch today. OK, perfect. So teach me. So let's start talking a little bit about what is Azure Monitor, because logs doesn't stand by themselves. They are part of a bigger thing. And the bigger thing is Azure Monitor uh, that we deliver. And if you look at Azure Monitor, uh, we start on the, on the left side with set of collection mechanisms. Some of these collection mechanisms are infrastructure that automatically send logs. So if you go to uh, to almost every Azure service and you go and there is a diagnostic setting there and you just click on it, you checkbox the entire thing and you get your logs inside Log Analytics. This is one way of, of, of doing stuff. We also have application level monitoring, like as you know from application insights, that you, uh, you go there and you add instrumentation to your application. It might be code based, it might be codeless, but it is application level. It has the notion of the application. It has the, the, the variables that you have in your environment and everything there. So that's another method. And of course, we have agents. And we have the ex existing agent, which is very widely deployed, like the MMA, very, very common. We are in the process of moving to the new agent calling, called Azure Monitor Agent, which consolidates this You know, agent is always like a mess. Uh, and we are working hard to consolidate it together. So we started with MMA was a consolidation of few other agents, and now we are consolidating the few ones that are not there. And we would have one agent that is modular and allow you to do everything uh, to collect stuff like that. Okay, so and then that, that agent uh, deployed on virtual machines in Azure or on uh, any machines uh, on prem will then send whatever you configure it to send back up to Azure lo Azure monitor logs. Correct, correct. We have now like, if you, if you look at the VMs, we have like three models. We have VMs in Azure. We have VMs that are completely off Azure and have nothing to do with Azure, uh, where you just put the agent. And then we have in between, we have Azure Arc. Okay. And Azure Arc actually opens us lots of, 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 of options. Azure Arc is much easier to manage, much easier to deploy. So in the, the past, if you have deployed an agent and forgot about it, Azure Arc allow you to set policies and it's allow you to enumerate the agent and lots of stuff that the customer are asking us for years. Uh, so we highly recommend you to go through the Azure Arc option and you can deploy Azure Arc everywhere. We, we have customers deploying them in like crazy environments that are completely uh, different. And and I have heard that some, some customers are using environments not Azure. I don't know why, but <laughs> they, they might do that. And uh, they can put Arc also there. So so it's, it, it opens a lot of variety. So Because what we hear from our customers is that they want a central place to put all their logs and metrics. And they don't care where the data is coming from because they don't want, when you have two kind of data sets within the organization where you have two kinds of languages, there is a problem with the translation. There is mismatch in the data. So having like, they are asking us all the time to keep a single way of collecting stuff and reporting them and querying them. Okay. And on top of that, we also support all kind of other things, what we call custom sources. So if you need a dimension, a measurement that we don't have, you, you, can, you can ingest it. If you have like your own code that is generating whatever it is and you want to send us logs through HTTP API, that's also available. So we have very wide, a lot of different collection mechanisms. Okay. 
Now, all these mechanisms boils down into two repositories of data. We have logs and we have metrics. And if you want to have good visibility, good observability of your platform, you need both. So uh, in the past, I heard like we need only logs or we need only metrics. The truth is that if you are in a, if you're doing real application in real complex environment, you need both of them. Okay. And each one has its own strength. So logs gives you the verbosity. Logs give you uh, much more retention and analytics capabilities. And metrics give you the very fast moving, the very uh, instantaneous uh, data points. So we have in Azure Monitor both of them, and they are working very well together. And then top of them, just having logs and just having metrics is not enough. We need to provide tools okay. and tools to, 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 to use them. So we have, if you see in the, in the top line, we have what we call insights, which is out of the box components that we give you. And uh, the insights are stuff like VM insights and container insights, which is super popular. We see so many customers enjoying that. And of course, we have application insights, which is our most veteran uh, insight in the market. It has huge array of ways to analyze what your application is doing. And we have tens more of them. Uh, and, and new ones are coming all the time. So that, that's that's like the out of the box, very, very rich environment. Okay, that's uh, not what we call, that's not what we use to re refer to in, in the days of OMS as solutions, is it? It is similar. We kind of evolved the solution concept into what we call insight. Insight is something more transparent. It's not deployable, it's there. Okay. Uh, now, we know that the insights we provide out of the box are great, but customers have more needs. They need to do more things with that. And this is why we actually give the customer the actual tools that we use to build the insights. And this tool is called Workbook. So all the insights that we build are based on Workbook. And you as a customer get the option to, uh, to build your own Workbook, put your own logic, your own graphic, your own terminology within that, you can actually fork some of the insights. So it, the insights are not like uh, black boxes. You can like take them and, and, and you can build your own stuff based on them. And of course, we have other like super powerful, super useful people love Power BI. People love uh, dashboards of all types that you want and you can create. We, we have lots of customers using us with Grafana, for example. Grafana has a very good support for Azure Monitor. So all of this is, is like a way to consume and visualize your data. Okay. But the next level is about analytics. So it's about how you take this data and you digest it and you get the information out of it. If you ask me, the, this is why what I love the most. We are, of course, using Azure Monitor for ourselves to monitor to monitor ourselves. And I, I like every, my day to day is like analyzing what customers are doing and what's working, what's not working. And I'm writing tons of queries, super complex queries uh, to, to, to get that. And we have the, the log analytics uh, UI for that, which lets you query logs. And we keep on investing there. We keep on adding new capabilities, new, uh, better query auditing, uh, better query management. And we are keep on like adding like new visualizations and way to walk inside because we talk to customer and we see like these people that are sitting there and is uh, trying to 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 get the insights out of the the existing logs. Okay. And then the next level is actually doing something automatically. So so like looking at your logs and just it's it's good or analyzing them. That's very proactive. But real life environment is super, super dynamic. And you want to code and you want to, to operationalize everything that you can. So we have alerts that you can take and you can you can be notified when something bad is happening. We have stuff that you, you can configure basically every logic that you can think about in in the alerts. And you can take these alerts and you can hook them to, to all other things that we have in Azure. And this is where we 
us being integral part of Azure kicks in because like you can take an alert and you pump it into Logic App and Logic App is doing stuff that you code something that is unique to your organization. And we have this mechanism where you can take things in and out. You can use uh, our stuff. You can use the data or the, the insights to do how to scale. You can use it to do all kinds of things that are true for your organization because there are no two organizations that are alike. Okay. So that's in a nutshell, Azure Monitor. Uh, and we would focus today mainly on logs uh, and describe how logs, what the architecture behind it. So we'd focus today basically on this area and how you design and what's the features and capabilities that we provide for, for very high scale. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about RBAC and we will talk about workspace topology. Oh, perfect. Uh, when we when we talk about um, workspace topology and RBAC, just a, a little qual qualification. Like by default, uh, Azure monitor logs, uh, they don't, like you can't, it's not going to store your logs for a, an extended period of time, correct? By default, we uh, it stores your data for 31 days. For 31 days. So if somebody yeah. wants to, uh, keep like historical data so that they could do modeling over longer periods of time. Are we going to talk about how we address that? Yeah, that, that's very easy. It's a property of the workspace. It's one of the things that differentiate the workspace from the other. Okay. Uh, we allow retention. We call it retention. We allow you to set retention for the entire workspace or for specific table within this workspace. Okay. All right. So... The first question that we always get is how many workspaces do I need? This is like the top, the top question I'm getting asked all the time. So I have this slide uh, that, that try to summarize the issue. First of all, our recommendation is to have as few workspaces as your business requires. And this is like really like tricky stuff. People are saying, well, what does it mean my business requires? It means that we give you a container for log and you give it the, 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 the interpretation. You decide what to do with that. Now, you don't need to use, overuse it. So stuff like RBAC, I would explain how you do that without a container. So you, lots of the other types of containers have this like, I need container for every team. I need container that scales high. I need container for RBAC. But with Azure Monitor Logs, this is less of an issue. It's not something you need to think about. It tells me how your organization is working. Like, um, let's, we are talking to very large organizations that have very few workspaces. I mean, like one or three or, or, or four of them. And we see other organizations that have quite more of them. And that depends on how your organization is working. How much centralized is your cloud? Do you have internal, internal regulation? Like if you have two teams that have nothing to do between themselves, they have zero overlap now and in the future, and there is not a single person that needs access to both of them, then there is no reason to, for them to share the same container. Okay. Because that's a question I've gotten a lot in the past is um, from uh, companies or, or individuals working for larger organization that wanted to do like a hub and spoke uh, type of organization where they say, well, we want our this division to have their own log analytics and we want this department to have their own log analytics, but we want to be able to replicate their data into the corp log analytics so that we could have a top down view of the entire organization. Um, and you're telling me that that's not an approach that we should be going after. Yeah, that, that's, of course, we, we support it. You can have multiple workspaces. You can have, have hub workspace and spoke more workspace. And we do have cost, customers that are doing that. But when you do this, you get into multiple other problems. So, for example, you ingest data twice. And if you have that twice, you have to pay for this twice because we have to process it twice. And you start to have these discrepancies between the, between the copies. Uh, and, and we build a lot of mechanisms 
to help you avoid this. So it's it's valid. We have customers doing that, but it's definitely not where we recommend customers to do it. And and then another thing that comes up with this mechanism with this idea is is then it's very hard to manage. So workspaces becoming another thing you have to manage, another thing you have to to allocate resources just to keep them healthy. And we don't there there is no need for that. Because we are used to the fact that if you are a different team, if you are the, you have different ALBAC needs, you need different workspaces, and that's not the case. And of course, you can have this if you have like a, a completely different regulated organization. So if you have like a, a, we are we we are talking to organization that have kind of Chinese walls within the organization where like this part of the organization cannot have any overlap with this part. That's fine to have like different different uh, uh, workspaces. Another very common need is you have like pod and dev environments or staging pod staging and dev environments is because like for example you don't need retention on dev environment. Dev environment can have very short retention while in the pod you want to have uh, full two years of retention or one year of retention. There is no need to pay twice. So. If you have these kinds of like rules within your organization, it makes sense to 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 separate the stuff. Uh, but if you, there is no need, there is no regulatory need, there is no one forcing you. The, we highly recommend you not to go there to avoid the management overhead and the need to to double ingest data, which is expensive and cumbersome and gets you to a whole slew of other problems because you now have two different copies of. of the same piece of data. Okay. Regarding scale, as I mentioned, you can have one workspace, you open it, you ingest almost nothing. We don't charge you for the workspace. You can ingest actually one byte or even not that. And then you can simply grow up, up and up and up and get to the tens of terabytes per day with the same workspace. There is no need to do anything else. We take care about the scale behind the scenes. Um, and another, another like frequent question that we get is about regions. Uh, you know, Azure have lots of regions, and this is one of the biggest advantages that we have. And one of the, it's actually a feature that we provide today, is the ability to have logs in whatever region you want. And then like come the question, do I need like a workspace per region? And usually you say, why, what's the need? You don't really need it. Like you might have assets here and you might have assets there and they can both send data to the same workspaces in different regions or in the same region, whatever it work for you. But there is no need, you don't have to have workspace per region. Okay, so how, if there's no workspace, you don't need for workspace for region, how do you deal? Oh, because it's a PaaS service, and so you don't have to worry about um, redundancy across region. Yeah, I would talk about, about high availability through in, in, uh, in, the, in this session. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we, redundancy is, is, a, is a, diff, a little bit of a different topic here. When I'm talking about regions, that highly again, this you, you should not think about regions. You should think about regulation. So there are regions that are unique, and if, for example, you have a regulation that force you to keep certain data within certain geography boundary. That's a okay. good reason to have a separation. Uh, but if you have like three regions in Azure on you know, the same geography, there is no reason to have like three different workspaces. Okay. Now, the one problem that usually people are grasping with is RBAC. Yes, because I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if we have this one big workspace, how do I make sure that, that everyone gets only the logs that they should see? Mm -hmm. And and this is a very big investment we made a few years ago, and it is available now. I think we are almost the only vendor that provide this in this 
strength and and and, and the ability to segregate to 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 set arbacs arbac policies per log or per record and let me show you how this is how it's working okay so the basic model is that you have containers like workspaces and each workspace has its own data or data coming from all kinds of 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 of, uh, of log of resources and what we are doing we are actually that the, we, the, that's the familiar workspace model where you have this like padlock on the workspace you have albac on the workspace and we support it we would keep on supporting it because there are people that need it. Like you have within the organization, you have security people, and usually security people have no compromise. They want to see everything in everything. Yep. And you have uh, people doing uh, central admin of the entire thing. You want to see the entire thing. And you have people dealing with cost management, and they want to do the, to, to have visibility to what people are keeping there. So for this, like, people you want to give workspace access which is basically you give them access to the entire boundary of the container and that's okay. great but that's not all your user i would even argue that it's not most of your users what it is super important for us to open the system not just for these unique people but we want to open it for the entire organization so if i'm a developer and I'm sending log, I want to have them. And I want to have only my logs. And the way we are doing that is that we are now tagging each and every log record in the system with the resource that created it. So the logs are now associated, strongly associated to a resource. It could be the VM that was sending that. It could be like the, the AKS cluster. It could be even if you have like activity logs coming from a subscription, it is also a resource. And each and every resource in the system, because we are in Azure, or we are talking about resources that are known to Azure, either because they are in Azure or because they are Azure Arc, we have RBAC for them. And, and now we can, we can apply this RBAC. So the model that we have is that you can actually access the system within the context of a resource. And when you access the system within the context of the resource, we don't check your workspace access, we check your resource access, whether you can see, whether you can look at the resource itself. So our recommendation in large organizations is not to give workspace access to anyone other than the central teams. And for the different application teams, they automatically get the access because you they have access, read access to their resources. Okay. By the way, you as an admin, you can block it. So you can say, no, 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 I want only workspace access. But but the default mode now oh, let you let these people access. So I in an environment that was looking at maybe doing uh, hub and spoke uh, in terms of having each team have complete access to their own data and the central team having access to everything, this really in effect uh, negates the need of that hub and spoke because you have one log analytics, but each team can only see the logs and, uh, and, uh, and metrics for the resources that they have access to. Correct, correct. And and it's not just like when I was saying logs that they have access to, it, they might spend several different workspaces. As we say, they might like you, as an organization, you might take the decision to, to have like two workspaces in two different regions. But if I'm running an AKS, AKS cluster, I don't care about like this, all of this. So these users, the ones that are coming from uh, from the resource context, they don't even know about the workspaces. So okay. the workspaces are the tool for the central admin because workspaces are there because of regulation, all stuff that the DevOps team doesn't care about. They don't need to care about, they don't even need to be aware to. So the, 
people ask me how do I switch between them, and and the, the answer is really simple. Like if you go to AKS Azure Kubernetes Services, you just click on logs, and you get the logs of this AKS cluster. Okay. And this is how we like we have so many users that are using the system that way. They don't know anything about workspaces. They don't know the workspaces even exist. They just click there and get the logs. Because if I'm a DevOps team, this is one less problem that I need to take care about. This is one less headache that I need to have. Like where so the ho the logs, how I, I manage it. Usually you have the central team that is doing that, and that's fine. And in this model, we also have hierarchy. So if you have like a DevOps team that has a subscription, they usually manage the RBAC on this subscription. And now they automatically have access to the logs of this subscription. You don't need to have RBAC for logs and RBAC for resources. It's the same RBAC permissions that you manage. Okay, we, so you, you said it once and it propagates w across logs, resources, and everything. So you're, if you set it up right the first time, then you don't have to worry about having uh, access to something that you're not supposed to in, on the log side of things. Yeah, I was talking to a very large organization that has like, they had like a log system that has had its own RBAC. And they found out that many people had access to that without having access to anything else. So like when you have two systems where you have two different policies, it's always a problem. Mm -hmm. Either it's just like more tedious to get access to and you have, and or, or it, you just open up things that you shouldn't. And people have access to stuff that they shouldn't have access to. Um, and and in the end of the day, when you don't have good systems, people simply don't use it. And you see people trying to do all the stuff around it. So we made it like super easy. You go to the your AKS cluster, you click on logs, or you click on insights, and you get the stuff that you need. As as an admin, you don't need to care about anything else. As as a DevOps team, you don't need to care about anything else. You just get the stuff that you need. And if you want to have a access to the logs, so the query the logs for let's say all of the VMs in a subscription, as long as you've you've got uh, access to those VMs within the subscription, uh, but do you get that from the VM and the log menu, or do you have to go some in the log analytics workspace uh, and then go to the logs and query it uh, that way? Yeah, so you just go to your resource group, and within the resource group, you also have logs, and you click on the logs, and then you get access to all automatically all logs of all resources within this resource group that are available. Another option, you can go to Azure Monitor Hub and select logs, and then you can select which subscription you want to look at. So okay. both, both options work. We see customers using both of them. Okay. The but, most but it'll way... only show you what you have access to is basically yes. the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. As long as you don't give this like users, you don't give them the access to the workspace. So if you give them access to the workspace, they can basically have access to everything. Gotcha. Um, all these details, and I know how complex this topic is because we give all these options and all these capabilities uh, we have like you can see in in this slide you have we have aka uh, ms slash logs access where with all the details nitty-gritty details and we are always there for you to help you and make you successful in, in the process so we know albac is, is is usually something you have to define once but we are aligned we are totally aligned with the azure Alba. So you have to do it. The stuff that you do for Azure for your resources also applies here. Well, the same. Uh, it's whether or not you're in an hybrid environment or a cloud native. It doesn't matter. Uh, basically, nobody should have um, domain admin level access to everything. Exactly. Like you, you do need those like break glass type of accounts, uh, but they should be used only. Uh, by the appropriate people, but also at the appropriate time. And everything else should be assigned based on what's needed. Yes. 
separately. Okay. All right. Now, one of the mechanism, if if you want to understand, this is an example of how logs look like. So you see, in this example, I took a screenshot of how it looks like within a VM. So you you go to a VM, you click on the logs, and then you see here at the top that you have the name of the VM as the scope. And by the way, you can select now a new VM and do whatever you want, but it still uh, you you can change the scope. But you start with the scope of 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 this specific resource with the RBAC of this specific resource. Okay, a and that resource, if it's uh, on prem or an ARC server, uh, doesn't matter as long as it's listed. Uh, in your, uh, which is why you mentioned earlier, if I believe, if I'm interpreted uh, your comments uh, properly, which is why we kind of recommend if you're going to tie a, a, a hybrid server, a server on prem or in another cloud to your log analytics to do it through uh, Azure Arc so that that VM is basically registered and visible through the portal and everywhere. Yeah, the VM is not just registered, it's also have its own outbox. So when you enroll, a VM into Arc, you tell us which resource group it's part of. Okay. So you don't have this like often machines that are not connected to anything. So when you tie it into uh, a resource group, you tie it into subscription that has RBAC. So you don't have like this like resources that have their own different paradigm. You have one paradigm that goes throughout everything and it supports hierarchy. So if you set it on the subscription level, you get it down percolating down the, the resource group and to the actual resource and the beauty here it's not just for logs it's basically everything all the goodies that azure is doing stuff like uh policy and arm and and and, and everything is working through uh, across the board in in whatever cloud you are in whatever data center you are it's just it's just there it's just working and we we, we hear like an amazing stories from customers that they in the past, they didn't even know what they have, or they they found all these like quirks and stuff like that. They they found that people have access to stuff that they shouldn't. But now we have like a very well organized paradigm to 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 keep this in control. Mm -hmm. And I I I realize uh, that onboarding all of those VMs or or workloads through something like Azure Arc. Um, makes a lot of sense versus uh, taking an agent and manually deploying it or automatically deploying it to a bunch of server in a data center because then they're not uh, specifically tied to any uh, group of resources. They're just sending data uh, in terms of logs and metrics to the workspace, but they're not actually being managed uh, uh, in terms of resource access for what it's uploading. Exactly. And and we had talked about like agent deploys and stuff like that, which is a big headache in the past. But with because the agent is just an Azure extension, it's also very easy to deploy it. So if you have Azure Arc, if you want to remove something, if you want to take it back and forth, it's really easy. You can use the same policy, the same automation, the same mechanism that you have to manage the in the resource group level you don't need to manage it machine by machine you don't mm -hmm. need to write like this custom script and whatever it is it is because we are using the same mechanism the same deployment mechanism that you have across the board okay and, and this age uh, azure arc basically decides or uh, helps you kind of manage which agent because currently we have multiple agents uh, i know you mentioned that we're going towards a more streamlined model of agents but right now azure arc will basically decide or manage how those agents get deployed to each of those servers correct correct okay. and that's very very different than what you had before basically everything you deploy through azure arc is getting through azure, azure extensions whether or not the machine is in azure or not Yes, yes. It's very easy to manage. It's very easy to enumerate and and to go to to remove, to add, and stuff like that. Yeah, and and, and visually as well is a Azure Arc machine in the portal shows up as a, a different than a 
uh, Azure machine, which if you're looking just just by enumerating the resources on in a browser, you can tell which machines are which. Yeah, we, which actually, we actually talk to customers that don't want to see the difference. They okay. have like, they want to see one set of, of VMs, that's fine. Uh, if customers, some customers do manage it differently, so they want to see it separated, but, but we support both modes. You, you can decide how, what view you want to, you want to make. Okay. That's perfect. Now that's all like, uh, the general architecture, but when we talk to very large enterprises, we hear questions and we hear topics that are very and and, and features that are very di different so we we have like a set of stuff that we have developed that is used again by the very high-end companies but it's not limited to the high-end companies and i would like to share it with you because we made lots of progress over the last year in this area and uh, i would start with the first topic which is dedicated clusters okay so when we talked about the single workspaces that grow all the way up from nothing to very large one, we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But for several reasons, we wanted customers to have some control over this process. And this is the dedicated cluster. So the dedicated cluster is when we actually come to the customers and tell them, hey, we give you some control. We commit to you on, 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 on some things. You need to commit to us, so you need to, you, you need to have reserved capacity. But now we give you a few things. First of all, we give you lots of features that are very high end, usually features that requires difference and settings within the hardware level. And these features are mainly customer managed keys, lockbox, and 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 we are adding and uh, we, we would talk we would see also double encryption and non additional encryption mechanism and we will talk about a few more that are coming okay that's one thing the second thing is because you commit to us and we commit to you that you have your own cluster we can apply less restrictions we can let you play a little bit more with the platform and 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 we make sure that you don't disturb others and others are disturbing you. Okay. And we can assure that thing. And the third thing, which kind of happened, like we do have customers using many workspaces. That you might have like your production and dev, you might have different units, or we actually have customers that decided not to 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 consolidate the clusters, but then not to consolidate the workspace, sorry. But then they do have the need to put the workspaces in one place and to have capacity reservation in a single place. So uh, let's say you have like dev and, 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 and dev and prod, and prod is where you have most of your data. We don't want you to pay extra money because you the dev is too small to get to get the capacity reservation discount. We actually want you to have as much discount that you get on, on the other one. So by allowing you to control the clusters, we allow you to move which workspaces you want to the same cluster and to reserve the capacity for them together. And that has a big cost advantage for several customers. And another by side effect is the fact that like cross workspace queries work now very, very quick because they are located on actually the very same hardware. Okay. But if you're if you're going to a dedicated cluster uh, and you want to move uh, two workspaces that, that are separated because of um, mandatory requirements for that geography. For example, if you're in healthcare in Canada, your data must reside within Canada. So it, it's a it's a good question. Clusters are physical entities, so they are limited to a single region, and we don't allow you to move data between the regions. So you can link to them only workspaces within the same region. 
Okay, so that was my question: is if you're if you're going to, if you want to have a dedicated cluster because you're large enough to warrant that type of capacity reservation, it doesn't necessarily mean that because you've now got a cluster, let's say in the U.S. or in Israel or wherever else in the world that you have a footprint, that you can move workspaces that are. So if you want that cluster in both the regions need, where you, you have need, data you need two clusters you need two clusters which means you yeah. have to double your capacity reservations you have to pay for it twice yeah if again class dedicated clusters are optional features you don't have to use them true we take care of your workspace whatever you want to do with that so we 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 have like customers that decided to to have dedicated cluster only on their main region and keep the others dispersed. That's right. fine. Mm -hmm. um, we saw customers that that are actually consolidate their stuff to the same thing, and then they actually move, like decide that they would not send data to the other workspaces. They would send to these central ones, and 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 we see customers that actually have more than one cluster. So if if you are an organization that is usually you have it with with Europe and US. And uh, you have like two, like two large operation, and we have a customer, and like every very very large organization have it. It justified to have like one cluster here and one cluster there. Okay. And but, but the, the 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 point is, I think, is that all of those features are optional, but they're available should you need them. Yes, correct, correct. And it, it's important to say if you decide not to use dedicated cluster, that's fine. We support. We have very, very, very large customers that haven't decided to move there. Uh, we have today workspaces that are almost a hundred terabyte per day, uh, and uh, and they are not on dedicated cluster. Like I think, like our top three customers, our top three workspaces, are not on dedicated cluster because the customer didn't need it. Uh, and and we have other customers which are smaller uh, that decided to go there. So it, it's it's a decision. It's another option that we give for, for for customers, and it is usually more connected to the question whether you are regulated and you need to have especially stuff like customer managed keys that we mm -hmm. will talk about in a second. Okay. So and and again, we don't charge you. For dedicated cluster, there is no additional cost here. The only thing we require you to purchase more than one terabyte per day capacity reservation. The need is to to have this like two way commit. We commit to you, and you need to commit to us because there is the, the, there is a physical reservation of hardware when you allocate this kind of clusters. Something happens on the backend. Okay. We another area that we talked a lot about, like very large customers, is to give like the top notch about security and control. Mm -hmm. And we talked. I, I, I'm always surprised, like organizations that I would never think that they would go to the cloud because they have like the top most security needs. Whether you can think about like the most sensitive financial organizations or government organizations that have like the most secure data like you can think about, they are moving to the cloud. And it's our obligation to provide them the tools, all the tools that are needed to make sure that this is working and they get like full control. So when you talk to very large enterprises, they want to have full control. So as I said, like we are doing a lot of things behind the scenes. But you have customers coming to us and tell us that we do want to have this like control. We do want to have this point where we decide uh, on stuff, and that's fine. That's great. We understand. We see it like a, it, it's. We are honored to have all these workloads working on us, and the way we do that is by providing few features that are specifically tailored for this situation. The first one is customer managed keys. With customer managed keys, we are using key, your keys to encrypt the data without us 
as a service or as a Microsoft personnel having any access to this thing. It is based on Azure Key Vault, so you have to put your keys there. Yep. But it's your keys. If you take them away, the data is now unaccessible. Mm -hmm. There are many different regulations. There are many different situations where you need it. It's kind of like an extreme scenario. But we are talking about the very high end, high end, and and the need is there. And organizations need to have the ability to revoke all their data. And uh, and we give this with customer managed keys. Okay. Is this something that uh we are looking if I'm and you don't have to answer if that's not something that we're allowed to say, but is this a, a feature that we are looking at uh opening up to everybody that has um a workspace, like a regular workspace? So we because customer managed keys are integrated in the low level of the hardware, we need dedicated clusters. So okay. it's available to anyone on dedicated cluster. And again, there is no additional cost to that. It's free of charge. Okay. No, I understand. I understand. I just wanted to know whether or but, not this is something we could expect uh, for the right uh, for a normal or a standard um, non dedicated workspace. But you've just answered the question. So thank yeah. you. We, we are looking on other options. We are looking on other options, but nothing in the, in the short term okay. around that. Um, so dedicated cluster gives us the assurance that the boundary is well secure. Uh, the next thing is lockbox, is that you have, and again, we because we run the service, we need in some situation access to the, the, the actual data or to the to maintain stuff. And with lockbox, we actually give you the, 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 the ability to control whether you allow us to do that or not. So it's mm -hmm. not just ask us asking, we need it. We are required to, to, to go there for you. So that's lockbox. It, it applies throughout Azure. And we support that as well on dedicated cluster. OK. And the last thing, and again, we can drill down on this forever. So I would just like put it here, and, and we can define it, talk about it more, is like the double encryption. Uh, we have the best encryption expert there and they came up with this paradigm where we actually encrypt the data twice in two different keys and that's like give you like whatever your regulator is asking you trust me it's not it, this one would actually keep you in in compliance so okay so that there are some organization and again like the very high end that have this like super complex encryption asks and we support like the top-notch uh, com com uh, compliance uh, requirements. So let's go to something more like common is what we call it's it's about high availability. You asked me, Pierre. You asked me about that yes, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So high availability is something everyone needs, and. We like if you know how Azure regions are working, we are providing high availability out of the box for everyone. But for for right now, for the we, we are going to provide a, what what is called availability zones. The idea here is that if you go to Azure region, they are physically segregated within themselves to at least three zones. We do have available several regions now that have more than three, but we have at least three in, 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 in everywhere we deployed. And these three have like separate connectivity to the internet. They have separate electricity yep. uh, feed. And they have separate cooling mechanism. Everything is separated. And, and then we deploy our systems and we deploy your data in a way that is redundant, meaning that if one of these three regions goes down the service keeps working and the beauty of that is that you don't need to take care about anything so behind mm -hmm. the scenes we are using something like zrs zone redundant storage and we are using uh, vmss and all kinds of other azure low low level mechanisms that gives us this kind of 
of, uh, of redundancy. And we don't like just trust it. What we are doing, we have like once a quarter, we have a procedure, we have a special region somewhere in the world where we we have our system deployed and we actually deploy a mock organization there. And once a quarter, we go there and there is someone physically going and, and pl unplug a, a wire somewhere to make sure that everything keep on working. Okay. And we are doing this for several quarters now, and uh, we always find new stuff. This is why it's coming soon. It's not all already there. We are almost there. We are not 100% there. And once we have it, we would announce it as, as, as something available. It's coming really soon. Now, the okay. beauty here is that you as a customer doesn't have to know about anything. You don't have to take care about anything. It's just working, like everything we are doing as a service. We are but doing... Yeah. If if an entire region was to go down, for example, like including all of the zones within that region, um, we don't have for log analytics or for Azure Monitor logs. Uh, currently, we don't have a capacity to replicate that to another region. Yeah, we we are working on mechanism to support also this like doomsday scenario. Okay. Uh, it would have cost. It would have cost because you need to pre-allocate. We want to make sure that if something bad happens, it's it, it, it's not enough to keep stuff on another region. You want to also to keep the the, the VMs there that mm -hmm. would be able to 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 give you access. Okay. So this thing is coming. It's it's more further down the road. If you have an organization that Doomsday is like in super important for them, let us know. Uh, but the mainstream, the ma what, like most of the organizations, uh, availability within the region is actually enough. And whatever, I talk to a lot of customers, including customers from telcos and stuff like that. They don't have these kinds of like availability within a data center. It's it's pretty unique and it's super strong mm -hmm. the ability to do that. And again, we are testing it over and over and over again, and we would provide it out of the box. Okay. The first step that we would provide it's for newly created dedicated clusters. People creating dedicated cluster can all, all even now can see the flags that are whether it's turned on for them or not. And we are going to widen and make it available in more places, in more regions, uh, and uh, for more scenarios. So, thank you very much, Pierre, for the for for this. Okay, um, uh, I just had one more question on yeah. the availability. Yes, because I've read not too long ago about. Um, uh, Azure Azure Monitor logs uh, data export to uh, to standard to storage. Yes. So are we? Is this kind of like a backup, or is it just like an offline? Or what does that mean in terms of availability, in terms of uh, scale, or is it just like exactly why? Uh, why is that? Is that a, a feature that uh, people should look at? Yeah, so th that's a new capability that we have added a few months ago. And we see customers using it for all kinds of stuff. So again, if you want to use it to export your things, to put them, to make them available somewhere else or to archive them, another very common ask is I need to archive stuff because this is my regulator is asking me to do. Okay. Or I want to make it available somewhere in the world. So that's one use. We see other customers that needs like mass export for doing like kind of machine learning stuff on the logs. And and we, we have like all kinds of like reasons and scenarios that people are using it. So you can export, you can export now all logs, almost all logs coming into the platform. Uh, it would be, it, it would include all logs pretty soon. And uh, and these logs would be stored in whatever storage account that you you want. It could be in the same region. It could be in different region as well. 
And that allow you also, if, if you have the requirement to have a copy of your data somewhere else, it's much cheaper option mm -hmm. than what we talked before about like having like always on one plus one option. So if you just need to, to retain a copy somewhere, that, that's, that's a very good reason to have export. What about cost? If we're if you're looking at a um, workspace and that in your retention you've set it to a year versus the normal thirty one days, um, the cost difference for that and exporting the data to uh, storage, just so that you can keep that full year as per requirements, uh, is there a significant uh, cost changes here? Yeah, the, the, there is it's it's there is a different cost like uh, export cost you to 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 export retention you pay per month, and the question is why you need to retain it. So mm -hmm. whether you query on that, so the stuff that you retain in Azure Monitor Logs is is instantly queryable. Yeah, stuff you export you can actually we have Paradigm and we have documented how you can run queries on top of that, but it's not really trivial. It, the queries would be much, much, much slower. Okay. And, so, uh, so, so it's mostly for compliance that we would recommend to, to do that. If, you, if you're just looking, if your compliance is to retain all logs for a year or two years, then you would go the export route. Yeah. So if, if your compliance requires you to, 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 to store them somewhere, and you don't really need them like on day-to-day -day basis, or maybe like... A, like uh, I had a customer that told me that he just got like a court subpoena to for for a record. So that 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 for this like exporting and putting this on storage is great. Okay. If you actually want to run investigations, so we had now a pretty large high profile breach, and we had lots of customers going back uh, six months ago and even a year to find out evidence of these hackers getting into their environment so they had like very very uh, uh, demanding need here so they ran a query we also have like customers that keeps data for a year or even two because they want to have this comparison mm -hmm. i mentioned the fact that we are big users of our platform and one of the things that i'm doing like constantly is like looking at the patterns so december how this December look compared to the other to, to the other December? So for this export would not be good. You need to retain the data. So if you it want to do historical modeling, you want to retain the data. If you just need to keep it for uh, potential access later, whether it's because you decide to or because of requirements, then export is the way to go. Yeah, and 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 we also see customers that have other analytics platforms where they need to share the data with. Uh, I mentioned machine learning. That's a very common thing. Like they, mm -hmm. they have a different platform, and you don't like you can do lots of stuff that you do on machine learning on 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 our platform. There, it's it's very well documented. But if you have your your machine learning guys working on, you have something already built, already ready, and you just want to to have this data available. That's another reason to export. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. Because I was a little confused uh, in terms of what the the use case scenarios for the retention versus the export. So I'm glad you cleared that up for me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we are done with the formal session. Uh, thank you very much, Mir, for uh, spending this time with you, with us. Uh, for you, uh, the viewers, if you have any questions at the uh, URL that you see below uh, is a link to our Discord text channel for this particular session. So you have questions, put them there. Uh, we'll make sure to get them answered. And uh, in also this link below, is where you're going to find all of the resources that uh, Mir has mentioned throughout the uh, the session and some more documentation that we will put together for you uh, for you to actually go and try it out and find out more about Azure Monitor Logs. All right. Thank you very much, Pierre. All right. Thank you, Mir. Thank you, everyone. And uh, stay tuned for more content on IT Ops Talks, All Things Hybrid. Thank you.